This episode of HVAC School and HVACRschool.com is made possible by generous support from Testo and Carrier. The reason why Testo and Carrier are sponsors of this podcast and support what we do is because I believe in what they do and they are showing that they care about technicians by investing in something that is essentially technical training. That's what HVAC School and HVACRschool.com is. So thank you to them for continuing to create good quality products. Also want to mention True Tech Tools. If you go to truetechtools.com and use the offer code GETSCHOOLED, you'll get 8% off of your purchase of high quality tools. And I also want to mention HVAC Hacks. HVAC-hacks.com reminds you, don't be a hack. This is the guy who once had to have a bank evacuated because he tested the heat strips during a maintenance. Brian Orr. Hey, 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 everybody. This is Brian. And uh, I promised you that this would be a two-part series. Two-part series on electrical considerations, electrical myths, I guess, is what I said. And uh, I, I am not going to back down on that promise. I, I, when I make a promise to you, listener to HVAC School, we'll, we'll call you Bob. Let's say your name is Bob. Maybe your name is Bob. Maybe it isn't. But Bob, when I make a commitment to you, I keep my promise. And today we're going to talk about grounding and bonding. But before I do that, I just want to tell you that I am not the expert on grounding and bonding. Now, I am a, uh, a licensed electrician. And in the state of Florida, what that means is, is that I worked for a licensed electrical contracting company. And in that capacity, I have done many, many electrical repairs. And I actually, my first job was as an electrical apprentice. So I've done electrical work for a long time. And because of that, I, I'm fairly familiar with the NEC, but just recently I've been digging in more and more to the NEC. But even more than reading the NEC, I've been paying a lot of attention to the stuff that Mike Holt has been putting out on the internet. And previously you had to buy his DVDs and all this to get this content, but he's been putting a lot of stuff up on his YouTube channel. So before I get into this, I want to suggest that you watch what he has. He has a great video on grounding, uh, grounding safety, I think is what it's called on YouTube. So if you go to his YouTube channel, watch his videos, he's got really, really good stuff. Um, But I'm going to speak specifically to some myths that exist in the HVAC industry or that I've heard or I've come in contact with relating to grounding and bonding. This is something that happened to me when I was probably 19 years old, 19, 20 years old, and I was doing a startup on on a system, on a house that the house had power applied to it but the air conditioner had not even been whipped in yet. And I specifically remember that. And so there was no high voltage whip going to the condenser. So I'm kneeling down and I'm, and I'm going to wire up this system. And every time I touch the casing of this condenser, I get shocked, like a, a decent shock. And, you know, depending on how I configure my body, it would be more or less and I would feel it differently. But I just kept getting shocked. I kept going back to it and I was thinking I was crazy. And so I go to the building super and who happens to be walking by and I'm like, I'm like, dude, this thing is something's wrong here. And he's like, no, you're kidding me. There's not even any power going to it. So eventually I take a meter and I and I just try different locations. And eventually I can see that in between um, ground, like physical ground, like I, I can't remember exactly how I did it, but I, I think I actually stuck a meter lead into the ground in one place and in between the unit. And I saw that there was actually voltage. It was like something I was reading something like 80, 90 volts. And I, I, I went to him and I showed him and he's like, oh, something does have to be wrong. And at the time I thought that was that the building wasn't grounded properly. That was my diagnosis is that the building must not have been grounded properly. Um, but now looking back, I realize what was wrong with the building is that the building actually um, had some issue with how the neutral was connected, either the neutral where it went into the main transformer of the building or where it was connected inside the panel. And I'm going to tell you why that is. So let's start with a misconception. The, the misconception is the myth is that current goes to ground, that all current comes from and goes to ground. I used to say this uh, back when I first started in the trade, that, it, that it's going to ground. And that's the purpose of your ground rod is so that current can go to ground. Electrons can go to ground, right? Well, that is false. Um, the transformer that feeds the building is just like a battery in this regard. Now it's alternating current, obviously, but if you think of a battery or a generator or an alternator or an inverter, anything that you are ever connecting to in order to 
create a potential difference, a difference in um, energy states is one way of saying it. A difference in charges is another way of saying it. So when we're measuring voltage, that's what we're measuring is potential difference. We're saying, all right, this is at this point has negative 120 volts and at this point has positive 120 volts. And when you uh, compare them together, then you have 240 volts between them, between these two legs of power. That's an explanation of potential difference. So when we're reading voltage, that's what we're doing. We're showing two different energy states, a difference in charges. And so current is a motion of electrons between those differences in charges. So if you have a battery of a nine volt battery, there's a nine volt difference in charges between those two points. And the electrons move out of one terminal and go to the other side. You know this, right? Well, for some reason, when we have a building, we think that ground has something to do with this. And ground has nothing to do with this. Nothing is going to ground or nothing should be going to ground. It's all going back to the power source. And even if it is getting carried on the ground conductor or on on, into the ground rod, it's doing that in order to get back to the power source. The power source in a building, in your house or in a commercial building, is the transformer. Whether it's mounted on the pole or on the ground, that's where it all starts. And on that transformer, if it's a, a typical single phase application, you have three terminals. You have your one leg of power, which is 120 volts to the XO terminal, which is the neutral, essentially, what we call neutral, the XO terminal on the transformer. And then you have the other leg of 120 volts. So between the two, you have 240 volts. And again, I'm speaking in round numbers here, obviously. But between the two, you have 240 volts. And then from each to the XO terminal, what we call neutral, you have 120 You have 120 volts. So 240 between legs, 120 to each. Okay. And here's what you have to know is that those two 120 volt legs are directly out of phase with each other. And the reason that that is, and the reason that that has to be, is because that power is created from a single phase of power. So when we think of three phase, the power generated at a power company is three, comes in three phases. In a single phase application on your house or on a, on a small commercial building where you only have single phase power, they're only taking one phase and they're splitting it. So they're, they're taking it into a transformer. If you look at a transformer, go outside and look on a transformer on a pole that's going into a house. Maybe you live in a place that there aren't any of those, but where I live, it's very rural. And so there are, all the, are the, still these, these poles out, um, these transformers mounted up on poles. And so if you look at that, you'll see that you have your, you really only have one power leg going into that transformer. There's only one leg of power. Other than that, it's just ground slash neutral going into it. But you have one leg of power going into that transformer. And that one leg of power is being split into two. And how it's doing that is when it goes into that transformer, you have you, the transformer is wrapped in opposite directions. So that creates an opposite direction sine wave. So now one, one leg of your 120 is one sine wave, and the other leg of your 120 is the exact opposite sine wave, exact opposite sine angle. So when one is peaking, the other is valleying. All right? But that's generated from one phase, which is why they always have to be completely out of phase from each other, because they're only created from one leg of power. They can be no other way. And so you really only have this one leg of power coming in and then your, your neutral slash ground. And I'm going to get into the difference. But when you are connecting, when you are connecting to that transformer to go into your, into your service, so where it goes down into your meter base, all of the power is either a balance between those two legs, all the current is either a balance between those two legs, or it's between one of those legs and that XO terminal, which is neutral. And so if any power, any current is going from your home or building to ground, then it's actually traveling through the ground and going back to that transformer. It's going back to the source, just like it does in the case of a battery, just like it does in the case of a transformer or an inverter or a generator. No matter what the case is, it's always going back to the source. If it's going to ground, it's only going to ground in order to get to the source because there's no other path, which is why when you have a situation where you're not properly connected to neutral neutral isn't correctly bonded to ground one way or another whether that's because there is actually a broken neutral wire in between the pole the the transformer on the pole or the transformer on the ground in the house or because it's not properly connected in the panel either of those circumstances uh, will result in all sorts of crazy problems like the one that shocked me because what's happening what happened in that application and later i was able to find out what was going on is there was actually an oven 
uh, outlet that had been turned on, the, the breaker had been turned on, but the outlet hadn't been installed yet. And so one of those hot legs had a wire nut missing off of it, and it was touching the, uh, the casing. And so it was energizing equipment ground in the entire building. So the entire building had an energized equipment ground, and that equipment ground was not connected properly back to neutral in order to do what we call clearing the ground fault. So the entire building was energized, but it wasn't clearing the ground fault. And this is with a completely intact ground rod in place. So you had all of this. So that's why when I was touching that unit, that unit was connected to ground, meaning it was grounded to everything else, but the entire building wasn't connected appropriately back to neutral. So it was using me as a path in order to get back to the, uh, to the earth and, and then connect back to that pole. And so I was, I was getting shocked because this is the next myth. The next myth is, is that, is that current takes the path of least resistance. Okay. Current does not take the path of least, does not only take the path of least resistance. Current takes all appropriate paths. So any good path that you give current to take, it's going to take. And we know this if you wire up a parallel light circuit. So let's say you, let's do this really simply. Let's say you have two points. You have one point that's neutral and one point that's 120 volts. And you know in order to make a light circuit, you just connect in between those two and it runs through a light. But let's say you had one light that had... 90 ohms in the bulb and another light that had 30 ohms in the bulb and another light that had 10 ohms in the bulb okay and then you all you wired them all in parallel so so electricity current could take any of those paths it's going to take all three of those paths and all of those lights are going to light up it's not just going to take one and so this idea that it only takes the path of least resistance is just silly and so when we when we say oh well the problem with that house was that it didn't have a ground rod and so the ground rod was the problem. No, it did have a ground rod, and current was flowing through the ground rod, but it was also flowing through me when I also became a ground rod. If you follow, if you get, if you catch my drift here, and so how a grounding circuit is designed in a building is designed in such a way so that it is connected back to neutral, so that if something were to connect to ground to equipment ground so you have a you have this outlet that was that was grounded out that this hot leg was touching the metal parts that because it's connected back to neutral because it's connected back to the source it's a no load path which means it will draw extremely high amperage extremely high current which will then trip the breaker in this case it wasn't tripping the breaker because instead of flowing through a really no load path really low resistance path directly back to the source it was traveling through a ground rod through the earth in between and through my body in order to get back to the source so there was current flowing there was current moving electrons were moving but it wasn't enough the amperage wasn't high enough to trip the breaker i don't know what it was in retrospect i wish i had been able to go back to that site now and do some testing because at the time i was ignorant and i thought it was just a lack of ground rods i wish i could go back and actually see what it really was the point is is that the reason why the breaker trips is because we are intentionally giving it a no load path or a very very low resistance path back to the source not to ground i want to say that again we're giving it a very very low resistance path back to the source not to ground so then the question becomes, okay, well, why do we, why do we have grounds at all? Why do we have grounds? What, what's, why do we have ground rods, I should say? Well, first of all, let's talk about some terms. So when we say things that are connected together, the term that we should be using is bonded. So we are bonding all of our equipment to ground. And when something is grounded, it means that it is connected to ground. And everything that we have should be connected to ground. So all of our equipment is bonded together to what we call equipment ground. Everything is, everything is interconnected to one another. And then we connect that to a ground rod. But then we also connect that back to the power source, which is what we, which is the transformer, right? But it's, that's the XO terminal, that's neutral. So back at your main distribution panel, you're connecting ground to neutral at that main panel, that main source, your meter base, whatever the case may be. You're connecting neutral to ground so that the, all the equipment ground is connected to the back to neutral and it's going to a ground rod so we call it a grounded assembly because it is connected to a ground rod however current is not going to that ground rod if current is going to that ground rod something is seriously 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 wrong now there is one case when that will happen and something is seriously 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 wrong when it does and that's when you get a lightning strike or a huge surge coming down your distribution lines. Now, I'm not going to get into the theory of exactly how this all works and why it is and everything, but lightning is a very high voltage, 
very high frequency power source. And when that happens, there's all these electromagnetic pulses that occur. And we want those electromagnetic pulses to dissipate into Earth as quickly as possible and not through your body. And so we have all these grounded assemblies that actually go to the actual ground. So when I say grounded, I mean to the Earth in this case, so that they can dissipate easily. If it wasn't for lightning, if it wasn't for these high high frequency, high voltage occurrences that can happen. And it can be lightning, but it can also be actually in the distribution line. So let's say you had a really high voltage transformer that exploded and, and high voltage energy came down the line actually from that. That can also cause it. But it's a, it's a rare occurrence. It's something that shouldn't be happening. But when that does happen, we have these risks. If that would never happen, if we never had any risk of lightning, we never had any risk of high voltage power surges, then we wouldn't need to ground our homes at all. In fact, it would probably be better if we didn't ground them because then you would have uh, less chances of actually being electrocuted in your, in your own home. But, and I won't get into that because that's a, that's another confusing conversation. But the point is, is that what we do have is grounded and it is grounded to ground with the lightning rods, with, with electrodes to your well, to your, uh, rebar inside your concrete, uh, whatever the case may be because of these rare occurrences where you have this very high, high voltage, high frequency power. Now, for those of you who hear me say high frequency and you're saying, what, wait, D- wait, wait, it's DC. Lightning is DC. Well, kind of. But lightning is, does go on and off. And so there is a frequency to lightning. And the frequency of lightning is very, very high. So we're not going to get into semantics here. But lightning is actually what we would call a very high voltage DC high frequency power source. And in some cases, lightning actually does come in pulses. So because of that, there's all of this electromagnetic energy that has to be dissipated to Earth. Point being, your ground rod has nothing to do with the day-to-day operation of your electrical systems other than dissipating transients. Is there some effect that can that it can have on dissipating um, electromagnetic fields in general or uh, in uh, electrostatic buildup between different devices? And maybe in some rare cases, but in most cases, what, what actually prevents that is the bonding, the connection of all equipment together through equipment ground. One example of, uh, of an abnormal condition where we see this is you will bond together pool equipment. So pool equipment will all actually be separately bonded together in addition to the electrical circuit. And the reason for that is actually to prevent corrosion. So a lot of people think that has something to do with the electrical. It really isn't. It's actually to prevent electrostatic charges from building up between them, um, which can lead to uh, dielectric corrosion. And I may be saying that wrong, but that's, that is how it works. So anyway, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why you want to connect metal parts together. And it really is only metal parts. Um, but this comes into play, for example, uh, I'll, give it, I'll give an example here of, of something that comes up a lot with AC technicians, is you'll, you'll have a condenser fan motor that will come with a ground wire on it. And you'll notice that the original condenser fan motor did not have a ground wire on it, right? And so a lot of guys think, well, I have to connect that ground wire. Well, really, you don't. You need to connect that ground wire if the original assembly needed a ground wire because the top was made of a composite material. So let's say you worked on a, a pool heater. A lot of pool heaters have plastic tops on them. And so if you have a pool heater with a plastic top, you have to use that ground wire because otherwise that assembly, the body of that motor is not grounded to equipment ground. But when you connect to a typical condenser top that's made of metal, you don't need to use a separate ground wire because that entire thing is connected to the metal of the top, which is then connected to equipment ground. So there's things like this that that you can, there's considerations here. Um, And the point is to make sure that all of your metal parts are all connected together. Everything in the building, all the metal parts are all connected together. That's what we call equipment ground, and they're all bonded together, connected together. There's another important thing here, though, and that is that you only want to connect to neutral at one point. And, it, and when I first heard this, I thought, well, why, why, why does it make any difference? It, doesn't, it, can't, it can't possibly make any difference whether or not you have neutral connected to ground at multiple points or just one point. But it actually does make a difference because your neutral is designed to carry all of your current back to the source. That's the design. Equipment ground shouldn't have any current on it. If it does have a current on it, either it's a very, very small amount or it's an undesigned circumstance. So let me give you a quick example. Let's say you have a, a furnace and... There's some current being carried back on the ground wire um, back to the panel. Well, the only reason that there should be any current on that ground wire would be like with a um, uh, with a flame sensing rod, a flame rectifier, where there's a small amount leaking to ground itself um, for flame rectification. But we're talking a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of current. If any of the current is go- going out of that blower to ground, that's a problem. It needs to all be carried back on neutral. And so if that, let's say that... Um, 
that furnace was connected to a ground fault uh, circuit interrupter, GFCI. Not that that would be a normal condition, but let's just say that it was. It's actually observing to see, all right, how much current is being carried out on hot and then how much is being carried back on neutral. Those two have to balance. If there's an imbalance, then it's going to shut the thing off because there shouldn't be any current being carried back on ground. If you connect neutral and ground together in multiple places, then you'll have your neutral current being carried in parallel between those two conductors, and that will cause problems. So you only want you only want your equipment ground to be there so that way it can create a ground fault. So it's actually designed, all of this stuff being connected together is designed so that way if there is a circumstance that current is going to ground, that it's going to trip the breaker, right? That's what we want it to do. If you have a hair dryer and you're, you know, you're in the bathroom, you want it to shut off if that hair dryer, the internal workings of that hair dryer connecting to the casing in such a way that it could shock you or your toaster or everything. You don't want any of these parts that have the potential of touching you and your family um, to be energized. And so if there is a case where they are energized, then that is going to go to equipment ground. It's going to trip the breaker. All right. But only because that equipment ground is connected to neutral. Cause if that equipment ground is not connected to neutral at one point where it actually goes into the house of so the house or building. So the main panel, they should be connected together. If it's not, then you run a safety risk both ways. If you have more than one connection, you run a safety risk because now you have current being carried in parallel along those two conductors. And if it's not connected at all, you have a major safety risk, just like the one that I ran into when I was getting shocked, being kneeled down at the condenser because I was acting like another uh, another ground rod with that current was flowing through me to get back to that transformer, to get back to that XO terminal on that transformer because the current doesn't want to go to ground. It wants to take all paths in order to get back to that XO terminal, to get back to the source just like a battery, just like a 24 volt transformer that we use. So another thing that kind of blew my mind when I was a, a young technician is I would take a, I took a transformer one time and I took the two 24 volt leads off the transformer. So I had, I had 240 volt power going into it and I took the two, two 24 volt leads coming off of a 40 V head transformer, I think it was. And I, I accidentally touched the hot lead to ground. And the other one, the, the, the ground side wasn't connected to anything, but I accidentally touched the hot lead to ground and nothing happened. So that red wire coming off that um, 24, the 24 volts coming off of that transformer, I touched it to ground. I, I said red wire. I shouldn't have said red wire. Who cares what the color was? You have the 24 volt side of the transformer, touched it to ground and nothing happened. I was like, what, what, what on earth? Is something wrong with this transformer? So then I took the other side with the, with the hot side disconnected and I touched it to ground. So the common side of the transformer, nothing happened. Thought, what gives with this transformer? So then I took both of them, touched them to ground together. And then of course it blew the transformer or blew the, blew the fuse. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, what's, what's wrong with this transformer? It doesn't have a, you know, it doesn't know which side is ground. Well, what we observe with a 24 volt transformer is the same thing that exists with a distribution uh, transformer coming into a building, the exact same condition, that neutral terminal on that transformer, that distribution transformer coming into the building is grounded, meaning it has a rod going to ground at the pole. I mean, if you look at your pole, there's usually a little wire running down the side and, and it goes to ground, right, on that on that pole or inside that housing that's on the ground outside of the building. And so it's grounded. And we tend to think, oh, well, we dedicated the ground. That's one way that we'll say it. And, and that's not te technically incorrect, but it, it messes with our brains of how we think about it. It's not that we're telling the transformer which part of the transformer is ground. We're telling the ground, we're creating a path through ground is all that we're doing. And so when we take the common side of a 24 volt transformer and we connect it to ground, we dedicate a ground. That's a term we use. You dedicate the ground, right? So now this common is dedicated ground. We're not doing anything. We're not changing anything in that transformer. All that we're doing is we're just creating a path to one side of that transformer through ground. So we're making ground into a wire that connects back to that point of the transformer, if that makes sense. And so when that XO terminal on that distribution transformer outside, they're connecting that XO terminal, that neutral terminal to ground, all that, we're, all that they're doing is making ground into a wire that connects to that terminal. And so now there's a path that exists between the, through the ground in between the ground in your house and then in that XO terminal. And that ground is really rendered moot it doesn't mean anything until you no longer have a path uh, between uh, on your neutral so you lose your neutral wire 
neutral wire gets broken, and now it will use the earth. But that is not the intention of that at all. The intention of that ground is, has nothing to do with neutral. It has everything to do with lightning strikes, power surges, that type of thing. But if you were to lose it, then ground will act as a conductor, just a really, really crappy one. It's a terrible conductor, and it's, a, it's, it's hardly any better conductor than your body, which is why you end up getting shocked when you lose neutral. I'll give you another example of this. At our office where we currently, actually where I currently am now, we, we bought a new building, and that's the new, my new office that I'm sitting in now. It's right behind us. And so when we were looking at the building, we were, th- there was some issue with one of the tenants. There was some sort of electrical uh, consideration. I don't even remember exactly what it was. But I got to looking at the exterior, exterior panel on this building, and so it has the main, um, the main wires coming in because there's multiple meters, and then those wires go into these separate meters. And I was noticing that where this, this giant can where the main feeders come in, where that connected to the meter base panels, there were screws that connected them, and those screws had arcing at every screw. So it was arcing at every screw point. And it was pretty clear that those screw points were carrying current for whatever reason. And so the, the part of the issue that was going on in, in one of these spaces, if I remember correctly, was um, the, there was a voltage drop. So there was a, like an inconsistent, inconsistent voltage. They were, they were seeing what they thought was a voltage drop, but it was really just they, they were reading low voltage in, in certain circumstances. And what was happening is that in between these main feeders and the meter bases – they didn't run a neutral connection. So the neutral was grounded inside the meter base, like it should be, only at one point. So that was correct. Neutral was, was connected to ground right there, and then it went to the ground rods. But, but then there was no jumper connection, no neutral jumper between the main distribution wires and inside the meter base. So there's this big gap here. And so in between these two panels, the only neutral is carried between the two panels through these little screws that connect them. So these little screws, whenever somebody was running a significant amount of uh, 120 volt load in the building, I'm sure these things are getting cherry red because they're, they're having to act as the connection wire in between these two panels and they were never designed for it. They're just mounting screws. You know, there's little tiny, little tiny hex head mounting screws in between these two panels. And so that's a case where this building has been this way for since it was built. I mean, the thing's probably 20 years old, 25 years old. And it's been this way the entire time because there isn't proper connection in the neutral. And a lot of times this happens because we have this misconception that, oh, well, the ground is intact. We have the ground rod. That's intact. It's connected. So we're good, right? No. It needs to get back to neutral. That's the source. And so all of your, all of your current is either going in between the two legs in single phase, 240 volts, that's between the two legs, or it's going between one of the legs back to neutral. It's not going to ground. Ground is for lightning. Ground is for power surges. Um, any event that happens that has an undesigned high voltage or high frequency, high voltage, high frequency um, current coming down your distribution lines. I'll give you another example. A lot of people think that you put in more ground rods, that's going to solve something. Putting in more ground rods does nothing. Ground rods are not going to, as Mike Holt always often says it, ground rods are not going to clear a fault. Ground rods are not going to trip your breaker enough to save you. The only way that you're going to have enough current flow in order to trip your breaker is if you have a direct connection back to the power source. So the reason why your breaker trips on your compressor when it shorts out is because it's going to ground, which is then connected to neutral, which makes a path back in that XO terminal between XO and one of the legs inside the transformer. I keep saying XO terminal. XO terminal is where the neutral connects at the main distribution transformer inside, uh, or not inside, outside the building where it feeds into your, into your building. That's where it ends up at because that transformer is the power source into your building. So having more ground rods doesn't do anything. In fact, if you have two ground rods on two opposite sides of the house, if you have a ground strike by one side of the house and it can travel through that ground rod into your into your grounded assembly in your house and then get to the other ground rod to the other side, you're actually exposing your house to current with lightning when you do that. So you really only want to have the ground rods that are required by code that are required to do the job that they're designed to do and no more than that. I had a, a friend of mine talked about how when he was in the military, he would go around just pounding round rods all over the place in order to try to get a better neutral connection. And he wondered why it would never work. Well, because if you have an issue with clearing ground faults or safety or whatever the case may be, an energized um, grounding assembly inside of a building, um, equipment ground, as we call it, 
adding more ground rods doesn't fix that problem. What fixed that problem is figuring out why you have a uh, improper neutral connection back to the power source. That's what you have to find out. Why do you have an improper neutral connection? Because that's what's causing that structure to be energized. Okay. Um, if you have an issue where ground is carrying, uh, if your ground conductors are carrying current, then you have to figure out, well, where are they connected to neutral in more than one place? Because they should only be connected in one place right where they come in the building. If your ground, if your grounding conductors are carrying current, then that means that they're connected in multiple places. And so an example of this would be, and I've seen this time and time again, where you could have in an outlet, you could have the ground wire, a bare ground wire touching neutral. Well, when those two touch, then it creates a parallel path where you are carrying current back um, down your grounding assembly, and that can cause some issues. It's not your grounding wire is not designed to carry regular current. It's just there to ground all of the equipment ground so that everything is interconnected. Which is also coincidentally why grounding conductors, uh, in, in some cases, don't even have to be as large as their neutral counterparts. And so, using equipment ground as a neutral in any case, you know, you're tempted. I know you guys have been tempted before. Say, say you're putting a water softening, installing water softening equipment uh, on with a 240 volt well pump, and you don't have a you don't have a neutral there, right? And so, well, I'll just connect to equipment ground, right? It goes back to the same place. No, your equipment ground is not designed to carry regular current. It's only there in the case of a fault. That's what it's there for. If you start carrying current on it, now you compromise the integrity of that system. It's so that everything is all connected in the building with no current on it. If current's on it, then it's designed so that way it trips. Um, it's, a, it's a good, solid, no-load path back to neutral so that it trips a breaker and it saves people's lives. That's that whole equipment grounding assembly. That's what it's designed for in order to create a fault so that it trips a breaker so that it saves someone's life. The ground rod is to protect from lightning. And I, I, I know I'm beating this dead horse, but here's what happened to me. Built this brand new house, standing in the shower, hear this loud boom outside. Next thing I know, I'm basically on the floor. I'm in my head's, my head's down between my knees. And I'm like, what the heck just happened here? Well, what happened was, is we had a ground strike right next to the house. Uh, I say that, I, I, I never found anything on the house itself that showed that the house itself got struck, took out my TV, stereo, some other electronics in the house. But the house was definitely, it seemed like it got struck very close to the house, not the house itself. Um, could have been the house itself, but regardless, I have plastic pipes in my house. It's not like um, there was lightning that came through the metal pipes and then hit me because I was you know, standing on a drain or something. My entire house is grounded, and so the rebar in my house is grounded and the electrode. And so those electromagnetic pulses go through the concrete and through everything, and they ended up traveling through the water and into me. And so I felt it. I mean, it was a good, decent, decent shock. I've been shocked many times in my life as an AC tech and as an electrician, and it was comparable to that type of shock. So the point there is, is that we think in, we think in terms of, you know, how the grounding is going to protect us, whatever. In that particular case, it helps it dissipate more quickly. But in some ways, it actually, you know, all the grounding c carried the electrons through my house. It just kept it from creating a fire. So nothing caught on fire in my house, but it did destroy some electronics and it shocked the tar out of me. If my house wasn't grounded, didn't have a grounding electrode, we would run the risk of something catching fire, but it would have actually been less likely to have shocked me in the shower because it you know, wouldn't necessarily have been connected. So you understand the point here is that there's a, a specific intent for ground rods and for grounding, and it does serve a purpose. It does prevent fires. It prevents issues inside of homes. It prevents issues where you have you know severe wiring damage in walls and all this because of the grounded assemblies, and it helps it dissipate more quickly. But this idea that grounding protects you in this universal sense is just incorrect. The most important thing is that everything, all the metal parts in your house that have any electricity near them, any, any current near them are all connected together through proper equipment grounding. So if there's anything that you're tempted to not ground properly because you have some excuse or reason, don't do that. And also recognize that it's not going to ground. None of that current's going to ground. All right, so that's basically all I wanted to say there. So hopefully just dispelling some myths. I was told by somebody, um, I did a little article about this, and I was told that it was not a complete uh, look at it, and I don't claim that it is a complete look at the subject. Um, it's, a, it's a very brief look at the subject, and obviously with some stories and things, just to kind of get you to wrap your head around this idea of grounding versus bonding versus equipment grounding versus what the purpose of the ground rods are in the first place, just so that you have a better, a little better understanding of that. But if you want to dig deeper into it, um, Mike Holt actually has a book called Grounding and Bonding, um, which is a great resource that talks specifically about this and digs into the NEC codes uh, related to this.
Um, as always, I would suggest that you uh, look at True Tech Tools. Um, I, I haven't been mentioning them so much in the last couple episodes, but if you go to True Tech Tools, you can find all of the tools that you need for your HVAC needs, some great electrical meters. Um, I, like I've mentioned before, I've been really enjoying the Testo 770-3 um, clamp meter for a lot of different reasons. Um, so you can look at that. And if you use the offer code GETSCHOOLED at checkout, just all one word, no caps, get schooled at checkout, then you can get an 8% discount currently. So um, get that while supplies last because I don't know how long they're going to they're gonna leave that offer code up there. But thank you for being here, and hopefully this was helpful to you. As always, you can email me if you have any questions or if you want to yell at me and tell me that I said something stupid. You can reach me at brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at hvacrschool.com. Thanks. We'll see you next time.